So, uh, and I'll go, because I'm the one who wrote this abysmal PowerPoint, but <coughs> <coughs> basically, uh, strangulation is, it's personal, it's controlling, it's really intimate, it's escalated violence, and it's, and it's not, I don't mean escalated in terms of like it starts with a punch, and then it, it starts with a push, then it goes to a punch, then it goes to strangulation. It is like the most escalated violence, like boom, right out of the box. And it's a pattern of behavior, so a lot of times with strangulation, you will see that this is kind of what offenders do over and over and over again. It is power and it is intimidating. <clears throat> so um, I'll leave this to the medical people. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, so what is strangulation? What is the actual definition? And uh, a lot of people call it choking, but we know choking is actually having something in the mouth. But everybody says choking. Um, so when I ask, I ask, did somebody put hands on your neck, period. So that's really important to just know um, because the, the habit is to discount it, but it is the closure of a blood vessel or the air vessel in your throat, okay? So we've got three great vessels um, in the neck. We've got the carotids, which take the blood to the brain, very important. The jugulars, which take the blood away from the brain, also important. Um, and then, of course, the trachea, which um, takes air to the lungs um, from the mouth and nose. Um, so those are different aspects of strangulation. I think one of the problems with strangulation in the medical field, looking at it in the medical field and the legal field, is how, ver how much variety there can be in strangulation. It's one neck, hands, or whatever, but it, it can look very different depending on where the pressure goes, how long the pressure goes on, and that type of thing. So what we're talking about is the closure of one of these vessels or simply the throttling of these neck muscles where they can actually um, get damaged and later swell up and then close one of those blood vessels. Um, so it's really important. <clears throat> We've got um, manual, which is hands, okay, arms. Um, ligature, which is using something else. And then hanging, which is usually a suicide or accident if they're doing autoerotic um, type of thing. Um, choking is the internal blocking, so that's choking on food, that's choking on a gun, that's choking on something. A gun? A gun. Yeah, sorry. It happened to one of my my. That's my not accidental. That's usually. not accidental. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's intentional or non-intentional, um, but yeah, candy, um, allergic reactions where they swell, where the throat swells itself shut. Choking can be accidental, but it can also be, um, yeah. So this, these numbers come from a very old study done, I, I believe, in 2000? Um, 2001 was when it was published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine. And it's, it was done um, with some of the folks that, that trained us in uh, Fort Worth. And it was a small body of strangulation um, actual cases, 300 people that they studied. And what they found is that, 90, and this is intimate partner, 97% of them are manual strangulations. 50% of the time children were present. 67% of the time the victims reported no symptoms. Now, this is compelling because victims do not necessarily think of strangulation as the most offensive event. So, for example, I had a strangulation case recently where the victim doesn't remember being strangled at all. She just remembers him kicking her in the hand. Later, he says to her, I strangled you unconscious twice. And that's when she starts, only then does she start to think, oh, well, maybe the strangulation was problematic. But in her mind, him kicking her hand was way more offensive than the strangulation, even though he strangled her twice to unconsciousness. So in my mind, obviously, the strangulation is like, holy shit, that's Sorry, holy cow, that's really serious. <laughs> uh, but in her mind, so in her mind, she's just minimizing the strangulation. And part of it is, like, thank goodness she doesn't remember the strangulation because it's really terrifying. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, if she doesn't, if, if, if I'm questioning her as law enforcement and I'm not exploring with her why she's having a lack of memory or having memory gaps during a specific DV incident, then I'm not even going to know that she was strangled and I might charge this as a misdemeanor. But if you're really exploring with her, because she did have symptoms, right? She didn't report them, but she didn't. She she had them, which was la memory gaps. 
Can I jump in? Yeah. Um, so I think what you're saying about the victims not um, counting this as strongly as we would as not just victims, but um, all of us yeah. in the medical profession, legal, right. and pretty much in the lay population too. We just don't think of strangulation, non-fatal strangulation, as being serious. The person survived. Yes, they're upset. They may have some PTSD. That's understandable. But as far as physical and, and um, cognitive consequences go, you know, if they live, they're going to be okay. And that's just not the case. So 50% of the time, no visible injury. So for law enforcement, this is really something to think about. 35% of the time, the injury is too minor to photograph. But... It's a huge factor in lethality. So are all of you familiar with all the different types of lethality assessments? So strangulation is pretty high up on when you're calculating lethality with intimate partner uh, homicides uh, or, or victims. So death up to 21 days, this, this statistic is actually changing. Um, there's some information I think that they're saying up to six months possibly or so in only 15 percent of these cases were injuries photographed and when i do the law enforcement training what i tell law enforcement is to go ahead and photograph the victim describing how she was strangled two hands um you know however she is able to describe the, the method of the strangulation and i actually think this number is low but uh it, it accounts for 10 to 18 percent of domestic violence homicides you guys have been working on the stats do you what do your find what have you found lately I haven't been working on the on the fatality stats. Uh, it's just as you say down here, the, a woman who has been strangled by a partner is six times more likely to become an attempted homicide at some point in that relationship. Although it may not be by strangulation, it could be by gun or vehicle or knife or whatever. Uh, and she's actually seven times more likely to be killed mm -hmm. by the same perpetrator at some time, usually within a year. Um, Again, not necessarily by strangulation, but by any means. So that goes to lethality. And the, also, your um, at least one study shows that of um, women who were murdered by partners or former partners, 43% had been strangled at some time Previous. in that relationship. Uh, and remember that these statistics are old, and and they they're really a small picture. In my experience, this one in 5.3 experience strangulation in relationships, in my experience prosecuting these cases, I would say that 85% of the victims that I worked with, would you, Sarah was a prosecutor with me, and um, I, would you say it's 80? It's, it's, yeah, it was pretty high. It's much higher. If they proved any domestic violence, they had a high condition. <clears throat> yeah. And so after 50 seconds of being strangled, approximately you're really not able to rebound medically uh, so this is the this again relates back to the previous slide mm -hmm. um, can I pass through this yeah. you want to um, after 50 seconds or more you uh, the reflex mechanisms for rebound don't occur spontaneously you need to help give you resuscitated at that point um, so I think for um, those of us medical folks, mm -hmm. uh, whether we're seeing patients acutely after strangulation or later on, this, this idea that half of them don't have any visible injuries means that we need to take the concerns um, and okay. also have a high index of suspicion because, as you pointed out, a lot of women don't remember being strangled. Part of the brain that helps us with, with uh, memory formation is actually the one that's the most sensitive structure in the brain to the lack of oxygen. Does that make sense? So that, that's why virtually no one remembers being strangled. Which is a good thing for them, but it's a bad thing for any of us trying to deal with it because you, they can't describe what happened. All they know, I mean, a lot of them will say, I, he was coming at me and the next thing I know I woke up on the ground. Boom, yeah. that's a huge indicator of strangulation. Yeah. Also, um, I don't know if you address this in the next couple slides, but women who have wet themselves or, mm -hmm. or soiled themselves, yeah. Uh, often they may attribute that to, you know, gee, I must have been scared, I peed myself, or I didn't know I was that drunk. And uh, that is an indicator that they were pretty close to dying at that point. Um, um, so, yeah, we, this is more um, discussion about it, that there's few scarier things than you can do. One of the things is we do domestic violence exams at Albuquerque Sane. We've been doing them for several years 
now and we're doing more and more. Um, the amount of patients who come in for domestic violence who are getting ready to leave their relationship, who are taking this seriously enough to seek help, um, it's about 44% of them have been strangled. So they're reporting strangulation at the event that brought them in. There is also history, we also ask if they've been um, strangled in the previous year. However, I think that it's just so, it's so altering. It is so scary that they're actually starting to come in and say this is important. Um, but we know that it's one of the best predictors. We know it's difficult, um, they call them choked out. Um, but they might have serious internal injuries and, that can go undetected and they really need to pay attention to this. And I go and I speak to medical people all the time and saying, please, 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 even if you don't see a thing, take a look at their neck, palpate it, um, tell them, instruct them what to do in case things get worse, in case they start to have difficulties. I'm sorry, um, touch. <laughs> it's a fancy word for touch. So um, let me, I'm gonna just jump to the next yeah. slide. So, yeah. and carotid is spelled wrong. I. I, I, I pulled this slide because this was the best slide I could find of, of the neck anatomy. So that's somebody else's error, not mine. But <laughs> it's very good. So you've got your carotid. Um, important. Um, so it's an anoxic brain injury if you should um, occlude both of them. It's very easy to do. Um, and it causes a lack of oxygen to the brain. So it's an actual anoxic brain injury. And when you think of Strangulation, everybody thinks of in the movies, they're like, eh, they're, and they're, oh, and they're kicking, and they're fighting, and it, and it takes a long time. Carotid, boom. Anybody see Holly Holmes go down, right, when she fought after the Ronda Rousey? And it took her seven seconds. It actually took her probably like six seconds of um, the near, uh, rear naked choke hold, um, and she went down, and she gave herself a little brain injury with that because they occluded her carotids, probably the jugulars as well. The amount of energy, the amount of pressure it takes to occlude the carotids is actually less than it is to open up this bottle of water. Um, holding their body, mostly you want to have their body held, but it doesn't take much at all. 11 pounds of pressure. Seven seconds to unconsciousness. There's actually a study done in 1945 about strangulation on the carotids, how long it took people to go down. Yeah, crazy study. Um, <laughs> um, and that it shows that people also have um, some tonic-clonic movements when they, go, when they um, lose consciousness. They have loss of memory, tonic-clonic movement. Which um, is? Yeah, I'm sorry, seizure-like activity where they'll be kicking and they might flail and they might hit the ground. So if the person follows them and keeps the pressure on their carotids, then um, we can have um, death happening after seven, Sankits, you're getting brain injury every second, and these are all vulnerable to lack of oxygen. And then you can get um, pee, peeing on yourself at about 20 sankits, 30 sankits to credit um, arrest. And like Don was saying, that after 50 sankits of that, they need artificial um, help to uh, keep going. The thing to know about this is, depending on how they do it, there's absolutely no marks. There's no petechiae, there's no, petechiae is micro hemorrhages that are caused from um, backup pressure, basically. So I just want to try an exercise real quick. So law enforcement, you guys are cops. How much pressure per square inch does it take to pull the trigger of a gun, do you know? It depends, but about the same amount. So, so I want you to, on your wrist, on the fatty, on the, the fatty side, you're not fat, you're not fat. The, the, <laughs> fleshy. The, the fleshy, fleshy, thank you. The fleshy part of your arm. I want you to just take two hands or even four and just hold it there. And I want you to time yourself for a minute and just hold it there with the amount of pressure you think it takes to pull the gun. And then we're gonna come back to you and we're gonna see if you have any marks, okay? All right. I just make one comment here. The one to 30 seconds for cardiac arrest, there's a, uh, another mechanism that is less common but can occur as far as causing immediate death is pressure on uh, parts of the carotid that are called the carotid bodies. Yeah. They have blood pressure sensors in them. And if those are stimulated, particularly on both sides, it can cause the heart rate and the blood pressure both to just plummet. And that can cause death. Apparently it's more common in children, but it can happen in adults too. Um, so just blocking the carotids would not normally 
cause cardiac arrest in one second, but uh, there are other ways that that can occur. So if you're talking about carotid uh, mm -hmm. occlusion, the the occlusion is the blood below, it's stopping the blood from going to the brain, okay? Versus jugular, which stops the blood from leaving the brain. Does that make sense? People can frequently see petechiae if you're at the doctor's office and the blood pressure cuff leaves a little red mark. That's a great example of what or we're talking about. Or a tourniquet, if you have a tourniquet, you can see petechiae in your arms, for example. A little bit. And petechiae, um, we know from autopsy studies that any particular we see on the skin or on the, in the roof of the mouth, say, or the inside of the eyelid, there are score, you know, magnitudes more in the brain, on the surface of the brain, as well as the covering of the brain. Um, these also can become more noticeable over the day or two or three following a strangulation. Mm -hmm. So the medical providers or police who might be interviewing someone later, you you know, the next it? day or two days later, it's something to be aware of, but it may be more visible if you're doing a follow-up. <laughs> did you stop timing yourself? And did you have any marks? You did? Let's oh, see. That's impressive. How hard were you pressing? <laughs> what marks? You had like little red marks. Yeah, see, had, it fades away. And did away. you have any marks? Yeah. No, yeah. so she had no marks. Yeah, you could have a little <clears throat> temporary redness, but then it goes away. And just give an idea, they say that a firm adult male handshake, like say Trump versus President of France, <laughs> both trying to, that's 80 to 100 pounds of pressure when yeah. you're doing your best. To. So you would crush somebody's trachea with that, ma that amount of pressure, okay? I mean, that's how delicate these, these areas are. So the jugular brain takes blood, deoxygenated blood from the brain to, to the heart, to the lungs to refill it with the good oxygen stuff. So this takes even less pressure per, uh, less pounds of pressure per square inch mm -hmm. to occlude that than, than the carotid. Right. And, but huh? But it takes longer. It takes longer. And a lot of times um, victims will describe feeling like their head is going to explode. That's what's causing that pressure. And you will see petechiae on that. So again, lack of petechia doesn't mean that there was no strangulation. It just means it's a different mechanism. Yeah. So um, the, the trachea and the larynx um, are soft tissue. They're cartilage in between with soft tissue, okay? And so that can also occur. It takes 33 pounds of pressure, so it's a little bit more. Um, and you will occasionally see, but only at autopsy, right, the hyoid hyoid bone yeah. breaks yeah. Um, and usually that's done uh, with both hands just and up against the hard surface so on the ground or up against a wall because you're really talking about using sort of not leverage but you're you're having and it's you're pinned it's not just walking up to you or even putting you in a rear naked chokehold that's a little bit more difficult and, and yeah and the victim is going to be fighting more this is your stereotypical movie dramatic scene where they're they're maybe fighting more um, and they're able to have more time because it takes four to five minutes. This can be picked up with, with x-rays or CTs. Um, on the high, the for, high yeah, fracture, It's a bone. Oh, okay. And um, one of the things that might tip um, either police or medical off to that is that pain more when swallowing or talking because that's when the, this bone in yeah. particular is used to help control the muscles in the back in the lower part of the mouth and throat. So um, it, it is something that can be suspected and detected pre-death. So um, this is how, sort of how, what I like to use as a demonstrative aid. Uh, has anybody here ever been a wrestler? Hmm. How, your ears look lovely. No. So <laughs> let's everyone look at his ears. They look lovely. Uh, so what is cauliflower ear from just a layman's standpoint? Sorry, called oh, dried up blood that forms. Right, so the cartilage has been damaged and it swells, which is what causes the, 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 the swollen nature of it. So if you think about the mechanisms, particularly in the, in the throat, that's cartilage, it's soft tissue. And what, what has been found with strangulation injuries is that they can build up scar tissue inside because it's difficult to treat it, obviously, to, 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 to do anything to minimize the swelling and the damage that's been done. 
So people who don't have, who've never had, who wrestle and have never had their ears treated, their ears swell up and they, they look like this. They don't have beautiful ears like mm -hmm. this man over here. Yeah. So, and so each time you wrestle, you get a potentially a new injury to your ear, right? Which is why they get worse and worse over time. So if you think of the mechanism of, of your neck, that is what is partially happening as well. And so each time a victim is strangled, they're becoming less resilient. So some of the statistics that we looked at at the very beginning are like the optimal rebound strangulation scenario. Mm -hmm. They decrease over time as you're being strangled again and again. So you will hear, and, and remember that each time a strangulation injury is occurring, there's brain death. There's brain cell death. So each time you're, you're re-injuring the brain, you're re-injuring the mechanisms of breathing and getting blood to your head. So strangulation is not, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's just, you know, force or it's just um, where I'm placing it. And it's really not. So I'll use Gail. We'll demonstrate various different chokeholds. So I prefer to be choked. Do you prefer to be choked? I prefer to be choked. So so I if think you what you're showing also is the mechanics. This is why it's almost always a man on woman event for crime because it takes a little bit of height to strangle someone, <clears throat> whether from behind or. or so the this is a rear. This is a classic rear naked chokehold, and law enforcement can attest that they're not learning. Are you guys do you learn this anymore? And why don't why don't you guys learn this anymore? Because it's deadly, right? Did Duh. somebody just die? Another person just died at the hands of police in California. I don't know. But I mean, you know, this is what happened to that guy, Eric Garner, was that he got a chokehold and it's effective, right? It's effective to take somebody down, mm -hmm. but it's potentially deadly. So if you talk about strangulation, anatomic location obviously has to be on the neck. Mm -hmm. Pressure is the, the pounds of pressure per square inch you're exerting, duration and surface area. So if you look at a rear naked chokehold, where is the surface area? It's all over the neck, okay? So not only am I getting it from behind. <laughs> she's so naughty. Uh, <laughs> she's strangling me from behind. Or, you know, there's pressure being exerted on me from behind. She's covering a huge portion of my, of my yeah. neck. Okay. Yeah. So this is, this is kind of a classic um, strangulation method where you're not going to see any injuries. Why? Because you're covering a large area. I mean, it's sort of like those videos on YouTube where you take a balloon and you put it on one tack and it pops, but you take the balloon and you put it on 10 tacks and it doesn't pop, it's because you're spreading out the surface area. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a, a rear naked chokehold is kind of... And no a, sharp edges. No sharp edges. So again, this is the rear naked chokehold. So this is a slice from above. So here are the arteries. This is the um, tracheal okay. rings and the trachea. This is the spine. So you can see how close that stuff is and how easy it is to kind of even use the spine as like a, a hard surface to, to kind of bump up against. So this is a strangulation case that I had. Um, the next series of photographs are from my case prosecutions. And um, this, I don't know what caused this injury. I mean, she, she this gal recanted, but uh, I think this is probably a bite mark. We probably have two bite marks here. My guess is that this was a left-handed strangulation. Now, most people think, oh, well, left-handed strangulation means that the person was left-handed. No, why not? If I'm left-handed, if I'm right-handed, exactly, what am I doing with my left hand? <laughs> or grabbing the lady bits. Right, so, so you're, you're holding with your left hand <laughs> and you're either punching or you're sexually ass assaulting. So usually if one hand is involved, the other hand is not just smoking a cigarette and hanging out, the other hand is, <laughs> is doing something. And so you will see a lot of left-handed strangulations. Uh, these abrasions here could be from her fingernails where she's trying to get the hand off. Um, <clears throat> this, this ecchymosis here I think is probably from a thumbnail or this here, um, or she was trying to get them off of her. Uh, yeah. So are you saying all of this is abrasion? Could be. It could be petechiae. It looks like petechiae. Right. Yeah, it could be petechiae. Yeah. Okay. This is a strangulation where she lost consciousness and urinated on herself. Do you see anything? Nope. 
I mean, there's some redness in here. There's some under her chin. But it's really, a beautiful long neck, yeah. Really nothing. This is the other side. So I think that, again, I think that this was, well, I don't actually know. I don't, I don't actually know what, what kind of a, uh, my guess is that it was a left-handed just because I think that these oh. are um, finger, like linear, where you see the mm -hmm. kind of non-red marks mm -hmm. and then like fingernails of the offender. And if you'll see here, that's up pretty high. So if you have a victim who has long hair, you definitely want to check behind their hair or under their hair. Um, is this your photo? I think so. Um, we've got some good scratch mark here. We've got some, uh, some uh, good marks back here. It's hard to see. It's a little yellow from is there a light. Light. Is there a dimmer but there's, here? there's various subtle, subtle marks now. Um, the, uh, the thing is, these can be really um, not very impressive looking. And um, my first court case, I said, oh, her marks on her neck were not impressive looking. And then they were defense comes up and said, you said this was not impressive looking. And I was on, it's like, I did. Oh my God, that's a terrible thing to say. But yeah, they're but, worthy of note because of everything that it, it, it discusses. So look to here on her ears. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you'll see injuries, um, and I'll kind of stand in front so you can see, but you'll see injuries like um, to the back of the ears from um, the yeah. earring post that right. will dig in if your ears are being caught up in the strangulation. So this is the same person a couple of days later. Yeah. Um, this is a number from Sane. So we know that Sane took this photograph. Again, you can see an ear injury and some, I don't know if that's yellowing from the bruising or from I the photo, but you can see shit. real marked uh, fingernail marks. It was probably from her. Maybe, we don't know. So this one, I think this is yours. yours. This oh, is, this is. I think that's yours. Oh, this is a homicide. Yeah. Although she's not dead, he killed her, her, her boyfriend. But anyway, so oh, you can yeah. you can see here abrasions on the chin, um, and a. So if you, so if you if you think about a strangulation again, let's do a rear naked chokehold. Okay. If 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 she's wearing a big jacket or a big sweater, and I'm pulling back you might find, and I'm twisting my head, you might see abrasions on my chin or along my jawline, and, or you might see even pattern injuries. Um, that's a lot of times where those come from. And if I had a bracelet or something, yeah. it could be up there. So this is her a couple of days later. You can see the, um, the fingernail marks. Uh, this is a, a victim of mine who um, was also strangled to unconsciousness twice. I believe that these are from her because they're up and down, so they're probably fingernail marks. I have real short fingernails, so she's probably going like this. My, sometimes you'll see victims that have a bunch of scratch marks on their neck. My sense is those people are, are conscious longer than, than this person was. I think that he was choking her so hard that she was able to kind of get one good scratch in and boom, down she goes. <clears throat> So this, this is a really interesting um, case to me because this gal later recanted and said that um, the strangulation occurred during the course of consensual sex. And um, now I think that this was probably a right-handed strangulation because you see these ecchymosis and scratches here on the left side of her neck. And then here you see some pretty clear pattern injuries. And you can also see some kind of abrasions here. Um, and typically, the, the statistics about who gets injured in um, sexual strangulation is, is pretty, pretty non-existent. But, but I think that any, any of the information that I've read is that, that when you're strangling consensually, you're not hurting people. Well, I, I personally wouldn't do it, so don't any of you do it. Because even, even in jest, I mean, you really... <laughs> This is such a sensitive area that you just can't even, I mean, to, to, to strangle someone like this during consensual sex is, in my opinion, still, the sex may be consensual, but the strangulation is not because that, that hurts and that is leaving somebody with some brain injury. But I think that, like, I think, let me just kind of back, back door a little bit. So 
or, or back my way in. When, when, so this gal said that it was consensual. And, you know, what we know about strangulation, right, is that injuries being caused such as this do demonstrate potentially a higher level of force, a higher level of intent. Um, and she has all the other companion signs and symptoms of strangulation. So, so you, as a prosecutor, you can infer intent from the surrounding circumstances. So even if the guy's saying, baby, I love you, oh, baby, I love you, you still have these signs and circumstances that say that, that, that the intent is to, to cause great bodily harm or death, okay? So I think that, the, that what you say to the legislators is, legislators is, you know, this is an issue of intent, which interestingly enough, strangulation is a specific intent crime, okay? So that is, that is the, the tell, is that it is a specific intent crime. So it doesn't matter what the victim thinks is happening, it matters what the intent is of the offender. So, in, so with this gal, she's saying I consented to be strangled like this, but there's evidence that shows that, that you do not consent to be strangled in this manner. I mean, it's very similar to sexual assaults. So you have, in sexual assaults, you don't often have these, these huge in, vaginal injuries, right? And there's this, you can never get a sane nurse to say on the witness stand that, that this injury indicates lack of consent, except if you have extreme injuries. So for example, I've had sexual assault cases where there was a tear from the vagina all three quarters of the way to the anus. There is no way that any person would consent to be, to have consensual sex in that fashion because it hurts, right? So, so a lot of it is, I mean, I think statistically we know that very few people actually make up sexual assault because uh, it's such a traumatic experience to report. I think the same thing goes for strangulation. And the reality is in strangulation is that victims minimize it. Again, they think that being spit in the face or punched is more offensive and, and more of a affront to their personal space than a strangulation. So victims and law enforcement and DAs and just the public, even though we know, we intuitively know, Strangulation is more likely to be minimized than it is to be maximized. And so you have to look at all of the surrounding circumstances um, to rebut that. And the other thing, you know, one of the things that's, that's happened to me as I've learned about strangulation is every time I see somebody even joking about strangling somebody, I jump on them because it is so deadly. So for, for, for anyone to say, oh, I do it just to calm them down, well, you, you are calming them down. <laughs> However, it's very different than giving someone a cup of chamomile tea, right? I mean, I, you know, if I'm calming you down by strangling you, that is, my intent is to calm you down by, by making you unconscious. I've never heard somebody say that before. I believe you to calm them down. I've had people say that to me. Oh, I, I just, you know, I just, I just did it for just a second. Just, I was just trying to calm her down. I needed to get her back under control. I had a homicide. This guy got away with homicide because he was like 6'6", maybe 300 pounds. His girlfriend was drunk and disorderly. She was a little itty bitty, teeny tiny thing. I think she was 5'2". She weighed 120 pounds. He put her face down on a mattress and just helped, laid on top of her until she calmed down. Well, he killed her. He asphyx asphyxiated her, but he got away with it because we couldn't prove um, intent. intent. Because his intent was to calm her down. Right. And New Mexico, forever. <laughs> forever. New Mexico, or, or New Mexico doesn't have negligent homicide. The feds do, but New Mexico doesn't. So I just show this ligature just because this this ligature injury happened um, by the T-shirt, and you'll see here that around the sides there is no injury. So this is just an example of when you need to look at the back of the neck. This is a really good telephone cord injury. Uh, this is a shoelace. This guy tried to hang himself. More of the shoelace. So these are stock photos. These are, this is just petechiae. This is subconjunctival hemorrhaging probably. Um, but like Dr. Clark said, you have these petechiae here. This, this is a homicide. 
th this person is going to have that petechiae all over their brain. Brain damage. This is petechiae, okay? Um, you're going to see petechiae in places that you don't necessarily think to look. So anytime a victim has long hair, you want to check the check behind the ears quickly. Tongue inside a mouth, eyelids. Uh, where else? Lips. Inside of lips. Soft palate. Inside the roof of the mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the gal from a, a while ago. If you notice, you don't really see these injuries on her if you're just looking at her straight on. But again, this is subconjunct subconjunctival hemorrhaging. Um, Gail and I were talking about this the other day. It can happen um, if you're if you're pooping, straining to poop, coughing too much, um, childbirth, anything that's creating that kind of pressure on your brain. But so the cool thing about subconjunctival hemorrhaging is that medically it's not dangerous, right? It does just because you have this doesn't mean you're going blind, but it's really dramatic. Juries love subconjunctival hemorrhage photos because they're like, ah, ah, but it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, in the, grand scheme, in the grand scheme of things. So these are signs um, that you're going to see um, or, or that you can see or read about. So petechiae, bruising, impression marks, fingernail cuts, ligature marks, burns, neck and tongue swelling, soiled clothing. That is huge. One of the case studies that we looked at in, um, in um, Fort Worth was Fort Worth PD goes out to this, this domestic violence call in that's happening uh, when they arrive. They, they sequester the victim and they're telling her to sit down, sit down, sit down. She's like, I don't wanna sit down, I don't wanna sit down. I've pooped myself, I've pooped myself. And they're like, no, sit down. Actually, she didn't even say that she'd pooped herself. She was just like, I gotta get up, I gotta get up. And they were like, ma'am, sit down, sit down. And they were actually a little aggressive. They were very aggressive. And they her. didn't think of her as a, a cooperative witness at this point. Because, why? And they panned the camera down and there was a puddle of diarrhea she was sitting her in her table. own diarrhea and she was combative part of the reason why she was combative is because of the strangulation yeah. so remember that with strangulation you are going to see disjointed memories you're going to see combativeness you're going to hear law enforcement talk about how the person wasn't responding to directives mm -hmm. because they can't even process like they're so has anybody here ever been strangled to unconsciousness you guys didn't do it in your academy has anybody so, or has anybody lost consciousness from a bonk to the head or anything like that? Answer, well, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> we will redact it from the camera, right? You've been knocked unconscious. Yeah, I dropped my spoon. Um, before, and uh, for me, I didn't. I lost my memory. Yeah. So you're you're going to have a, a a mental status change when you awake from being strangled. So it is going to um, exhibit as combativeness, not willing that you know inability almost to process information, to listen, to sit down, to, to describe events linearly. Right. Big, big thing with victims who have had strangulation is, and loss of consciousness, you're not going to have any kind of a linear uh, descriptor. Um, a lot of times you're going to see injuries to the back of the head. Can anybody think why? If I'm being strangled up against a wall, I'm going to be trying to get away. I might be bonking my head on the back. You also might see injuries on the shoulders. Um, so if I'm in a rear naked chokehold and I'm trying to get away, you might see injuries or abrasions on my shoulders from that person pushing down. Um, vomit, raspy breath. Um, so if, you, if, you, if you're meeting with somebody, and this can occur even like a week later, if you're meeting with someone, they're 18 years old, they look healthy and fit, but they sound like the smoker from The Simpsons. They're like, hi, my name is Barb. <laughs> that, that is potentially somebody who has a raspy breath, raspy throat breathing from the strangulation. I had a patient who had been strangled about five months previous and she had a chronic little cough, little, little like she, like Itch. it was, um, like she was on lisinopril or something and um, a little <clears throat> throat clearing and it, had, it lasted for about six months and um, it was a real high strangulation he had been. So this is just um, looking for, um, make sure you look for those signs and symptoms. Go ahead, we can get through this. Um, we're gonna talk about narratives. We talk about what did the patient say happened? Um, and you're gonna want to take the words of the patient. She said this subject pushed her under the bed, started choking her. 
you know, that's not the time to go, oh, you mean strangulation. Um, she said she was having trouble breathing but never passed out, dragged her into the bathroom, again started choking her. She fought back and scratched him but not sure where. Victim said he held her down and hit her several times in her mouth and forehead. Um, so you're going to be thinking, when we're getting that kind of narrative, we're going to be thinking of where we're going to be looking, how we're going to be um, describing, and what signs and symptoms we're going to be expecting. She said he tried to undo the belt to her pants but ran out when she screamed. Okay. How did he choke her? Several times, actually. Um, so evidence of alterations of consciousness and oxic, you're going to have, they're going to report to you. So these are the symptoms that is really important to stop and, okay, you're not looking at red marks anymore. You're going to ask what happened to you, what did you feel. So these are symptoms that medical people go off of all the time. Paired to dizziness, stunned, disoriented. Seeing stars or spots, having a narrowing in is the sign of anoxia where you're going to pass out. Loss of memory, like we said, the hippocampus is really um, vulnerable. Shutting down. Shutting down. Um, standing up one moment, waking up on the floor. If you like, you can YouTube people getting strangled, and um, seven seconds later, they're on the floor. Change of location. I was in the bedroom, and then I was somehow ended up in the kitchen, or somehow I was in the car. Um, I don't know how that happened. Bowel or bladder, like we said, unexplained bump on the head. Um, so when we are asking our patients, so we've been screening for strangulation since we started 20 years ago, yay. Um, Have you really? Yeah, it's, it's pretty uncommon in our sexual assault cases. If it's sexual assault with DV, like I was telling Don, um, we see a correlation. So, you know, we've got the DV world, we've got the sexual assault world. We work both. Um, but when we have a domestic violence sexual assault, we're, we're seeing strangulation in about 80% of those cases. That's huge, huge power and control. They're pissed at this point. So um, we're asking, how did they strangle? If they remember, we're going to take how they remember. If an object was used, how many times was the victim strangled? Um, how long did the strangling last? That's a really difficult question. Um, I will say a long time, or it was really brief, or um, it felt like forever. My lady this morning said it lasted a minute, um, and she, it actually it sounded like it really did last that long. Um, how tight was the grip? Were they um, shaken, thrown? Now, so this is a general screen. Were they sexually assaulted? Have the victim show and um, have them demonstrate it. It's nice to have a, I needed one this a morning because she was like, it's like, and she couldn't do it on herself. She was like, she was shaking so bad. So wig heads, you can get them on Amazon. We use them um, in, in prosecution um, and I always give them to cops to put in the back seat of their in their trunk so that if they're out on a call they can have the victim demonstrate. And legally, of course, for Edna, what did they say during? But let me just interrupt. Cameron's laughing, but juries love that shit. They love it. They, they love it. They, they love, love it. those demonst demonstrative aids. They yeah. love it. And wig heads are so cheap that as a prosecutor you can enter that stuff into evidence. They cost a buck. They're they're such a great resource. They're such a great tool. Um, I think it's yeah. also, I just want to add, it's really important that, that to try and get victims to articulate what they thought was going to happen. Right. We have that on the... They're um, going to say, I thought I was going to die. Um, so, yeah, the symptoms, the patient says, their voices change, their horrors. Um, sometimes if they're with somebody who knows them, I'll be like, does she always sound like Barb from The Simpsons? Difficulty swallowing is huge. Breathing changes. Um, and, of course, medically, if somebody's sitting there talking to me and... Um, they're having some problems. If they're increasing their symptoms over two days, um, we want them to go back to the hospital right away. So um, this is our sheet that we use in our medical charts, and this is very common um, for many, many charts. So we're going to look at whether we observed it, whether it was reported, um, all of the possibility of, of um, what kind of symptoms, and we're going to attest to these. Um, how did they do it? How long? How hard? Multiple attempts, multiple methods. Do they know if they were right-handed? If it's somebody they don't know real well, they won't know. Pounded, yes. What did they say? I'm going to kill you. This is, Say goodbye, bitch, is a great quote to have, unfortunately. Um, but the patient, sometimes well, they just say, frequently they said, just shut up, just shut up. Um, what did the patient feel was going to happen? Um, 95, 96% of the patients say, I thought I was going to die. That is absolutely the truth. And I have 
we have them. And one lady, she was, it was a sexual assault. And it was brief, brief, brief. She said, oh, it was just for a second. It was just brief, but it was really hard. And I said, and then what did you do after? And she said, I did whatever he told me to. You know, I mean, that's what this is to them. So this is the lady showing. She has good marks here. She had nothing on her neck, but we're having her show. Um, so talking how, how long, what did they look like? Um, was this a part of sex? Was this part of sex? That's, um, this is another slide from other, what do they say, um, self-inflicted. They're more, so one of the things I like to talk to medical people, anybody doing domestic violence exams, anyone treating this legally, they're likely to participate later if they get immediate victim advocacy, okay, an advocate, yay, if their needs are being met, um, if they're getting communication with the, um, police, they're getting um, needs advocates and um, medical, if the defendant stays in custody. Which is uh, not happening in Albuquerque. You know, I had a terrible um, DV. She was tuned up. This poor lady was medically already a mess. She was not young, um, not healthy, and she was swollen. She had spent the entire night at UNMH ER, and she had come to me at about noon. And while I'm talking to her, getting all the background and stuff, they call from the vine and said, your offender's now released. <laughs> Boom, she's out the door. I couldn't finish her exam. I couldn't do anything. She was panic. It was, she was gone. She had already spent more time on this offense than he had. Um, so she had to go home and get the dog. I mean, it was... It was so immediate. So it's so important if they get follow-up and immediate care. This will change because we know one of the frustrations with prosecutions is they recant. They don't recant, they recant. But we need advocacy, we need medical, and we need people to say this is so important. Go ahead. And I just wanna say that, that when I was doing um, routine periodic training, at least with Albuquerque Police Department and Burlingo County Sheriff's Department, it was great because they, their reports were reflecting the training, okay? And victims were reflecting the training because the officers would talk to victims about lethality. Mm -hmm. And when officers would talk to victims about lethality, victims are processing the information. So even if they're not making a decision to leave, they understand how serious it is. So they're more likely to seek assistance, whether it's medical oh, or yeah, calling yeah. the police or whatever. So the more victims understand how serious strangulation is, because the thing about strangulation is that I guarantee you that every victim you talk to has probably experienced strangulation. And victims think you're psychic when you're able to say to them, were you strangled? Did you see stars? Right. Did you, how did he do it? Did you wet your pants? Did you, did right. you wake up in one place and you started in another? They're like, how did you know that? How do you know that he strangles me? Because they, they do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> strangulation is like the most controlling, intimate, way to immediately get control of a situation and to render a victim unable to assist. So we know that it happens over and over and over again. And so the more we're able to educate even, the more impact we're able to have. And uh, APDs, I don't see those strangulation, that strangulation language in police reports anymore because I haven't been doing, the, not that I'm so great, but nobody's doing the training. The other thing is when the officer writes in there, says she was strangled, however, there are no signs on the neck. I mean, your case is dead at yeah. that point. Like, that is, it's one of those things you can, you can hear her and she can be talking like that. But I had a police report once where, where the officer wrote, there were no signs of any strangulation or something, and I checked here and here. It's like the, the language on being used by the people investigating is just so incredibly important because I read that and went, well, okay, we have to figure out what to do from here. And the other cool thing about strangulation training, okay, you know, through this, through this task force or through the MDT that we've done is that every single one of us are now capable of testifying in, in a court, okay? So, and when, when I was doing the training with my officers, I'd say, look, you can now testify about strangulation and you don't have to be a medical doctor to testify about all of the signs and symptoms. Yes, medical doctors are great, but, you know, I had doctors at, at, at UNM ER who were like, oh, strangulation is no big deal. I'd call up Cameron and say, this doctor told me it was no big deal. And Cam's like, I'll get them the reports, you know. So, yeah. I mean, it, it really is a matter of education. And anybody, we all can recognize just kind of as lay people the danger of strangulation because we don't do it to each other, right? It's not... 
I mean, law enforcement isn't allowed to use it. So I think we have the ability to educate about something that is uniform amongst offenders and is a way to get through to victims about the perilous nature of their relationships because a lot of times they think, well, if he isn't stabbing or shooting me, it's not that big of a deal. But the reality is that it is. And medically, we do, when I speak to somebody about strangulation, I am going, yes, this is question and answer time. Um, <laughs> um, that this is big, and if you come back, you might not be able to come back. This is heading towards lethality. 